Hello, and welcome to Talk From Superheroes. Hey, everybody, I'm Andrew Rodney. And I'm Diana McCullum. And you're listening to Talk From Superheroes, where every week we discuss a piece of superhero television or film. Uh, and this week on the podcast, we are talking about the, uh, the 2004 remake of Dawn of the Dead. And why are we talking about the 2004 remake of Dawn of the Dead? Zack Snyder, of course. Because of our dear friend Zack Snyder. We can't get enough of this guy. It's Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead, the Snyder Cut. I mean, it probably was the Snyder Cut of the Dawn of I the mean, Dead. I it mean, re- it would have to be. Uh, yeah, I haven't yeah. heard of studio interference uh-huh. with I, the Dawn of the Dead. I don't think he had the power in his career at that point yet to mm-hmm. really like push for the film that I'm sure he would have wanted. So this probably still has some studio on it. Uh, well, some some edits that maybe Snyder didn't approve of. Oh, um, who knows? Well, we'll discuss in I, a bit. I don't think that there's a four-hour cut of this anywhere. I though. don't. I was surprised it was less than two hours, not going to lie. I was so happy to see that. Happy about it, but surprised. Mm-hmm. What we like to call a pleasant surprise is oh, probably yeah. how I should have phrased it. Oh, under two hours? Oh, mwah, mwah. Mwah. oh. And I bring this up because next week we're doing Army of the Dead, we- directed by Zack Snyder. Two hours, 24 minutes, Zack Snyder. Does not need to be that. It's a zombie movie. Yes. One movie a year, only (laughs) illegally, one movie a year should be allowed to be over two hours. And you guys have to have a consensus of who it's going to be. Absolutely. You can't all just think you're going to be it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's and like you would have to like rotate studios. I think legally would be like the best way to do it. You know, like the Ooh. way that like yeah yeah like the way that like TV networks rotate who ha- who gets the upfronts, uh, whether like that type of shit where it's like, you've got to rotate it and figure out which studio starts and then go through a rotation. But every year, only one movie is legally allowed to be longer than two hours. I like it. It's like a lottery pick in the NBA. Like you got to yeah. get a number one draft pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're hope, you if you want to make that movie, you, you've got to hope for that, you right? You got to get the over two hour. And then studios have a great excuse to tell directors. You know, we don't have it. Yeah, your Snyders, your Nolans are like, this has to be three hours. And then Universal Pictures can be like, I wish we could, but it's the law. We like, signed a contract. You are right. There is nothing that can be edited. There is no fat. You've created the most perfect piece of art in the history of time. But the law, the legal law means that we have to do it under two hours. And then there's a two hour version of Tenet. And it's actually maybe kind of good, and Christopher Nolan has an aneurysm. It's at least medium. It's, it's at least at medium. It's at least a medium. It's at least medium, maybe. Mm. Uh, so that's what we think laws should be. But this week, we are talking about the breezy, under two hours, Dawn of the Dead remake from Zack Snyder in uh, in build-up to next week's release of Army of the Dead, uh, his, uh, his film that's going to be released on Netflix, a Netflix exclusive. We don't think it's a sequel. We'll find out. I'm willing to bet it's not. I haven't noticed any similar cast members. Uh, nor, ha- <laughs> nor have I noticed any credit to George Romero as Ooh, the founder of the universe. You and would have he to would do have that. to give a based on mm. uh, credit for it being the the Romero franchise. Fair enough. So next yeah. week we'll be doing that. Yeah. yeah. This week. But this week we are talking about Dawn of the Dead. And, our last Snyder. Uh, I mean, last ish. Oh, also over on our Patreon right now, we are uh, we are doing. Legend of the Guardians, <laughs> the Owls of Gahul. Oh it's my Gahul. God, I think that's the title. Uh, Legends of the Guardians, the Owls of Gahul. The other Zack Snyder film, an animated owl movie that he did in the middle of like, it was like 300 Dawn of the Dead a- animated owls because Sucker his work punch. is insane. So What a guy. To complete our understanding of Zack Snyder. I'm going to be able to analyze this man hard after this. I think we'll legitimately be experts on the works of Zack Snyder after this. So Legends of the Gu- Legend of the Guardians, the Owls of Gahul is over on our Patreon, then Army of the Dead next week. Then I think that that's all the Snyder. We've done a lot of I it. I think I looked at his IMDb and that was everything except for like one music video that got on his IMDb somehow. Yeah, we would have to go into the music videos and like the TV commercials that he's done. I guess that's our next step. That's going to be the Next thing, look forward to that next month on the podcast when we talk about Zack Snyder's Subaru commercial. Uh, <laughs> but special bonus, special episode. bonus episode. Uh, and as well, before we get into this week's episode, uh, we want to acknowledge and give a shout out to everybody who reached out to us uh, on social media on uh, on Twitter at From Superheroes. Uh, to mention last week's episode, how blissfully ignorant we were of the Dust Bowl. We weren't familiar with the Dust Bowl. 
Guys, I guess they don't teach the Dust Bowl in Canada, at least not the provinces we live in. We think maybe in the prairie provinces, which are more farmlandy, they we, might learn about them. We took a poll. Canadians seem to be a mixed bag. Last week on the podcast, when we covered Jupiter's legacy, which takes place uh, during the Great Depression, and we were like, why shit so dusty? Where did the crops go? Because we didn't know. The economy crashed and the crops exploded, it yeah. seems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like you know. Of course. We knew economy bad. Like, we we knew of the Great Depression, but they never even said Dust Bowl. It was just like, the show was just like, Great Depression. And then, you know how everything's dusty? And we didn't follow that because apparently Americans uh, and, and readers of at least the Grapes of Wrath or people who saw Interstellar, uh, seem, those seem to be the two big works of art, Interstellar and Grapes of Wrath, that taught people a lot about the Dust Bowl. This has been a wild week on Twitter. I have several things to say. Mm -hmm. First of all, genu this is a genuine thank you to our fans because we got a lot of tweets about the Dust Bowl, but you were all very kind about it. None yeah. of you were condescending, like, it's obviously the Dust Bowl. You everyone guys, was pretty chill. Everyone, Most of you were just like, do they not teach you about the Dust Bowl in Canada? And we were like, they do not. They do not. Mixed bag. Mixed bag. And also learning that the Dust Bowl has literally two co pop culture touchstones, which is Grapes of Wrath and Interstellar, and yeah. finding out who learned it from which has been very fun. And because when we were kind of, we did a survey, an informal survey on our Twitter, and Canada seems to be like, it was like, uh, I think about half knew it. Mm -hmm. And then, like, a little bit, kind of, a 20%-ish new, like, oh, I've heard the term, but had no idea. And there were some hard no's. And when we pulled it amongst our friends, it seemed to be the kind of the consensus that in Canadian prairie provinces, it's something that they're a bit more aware of because that's where our large agricultural practices are and they were actually affected by it. Uh, so, like, middle Canada knows more about the Dust Bowl. Diana and myself are from the east coast of Canada, Newfoundland so, and New Brunswick. Uh, shout and out I, New Brunswick. And I never read The Grapes of Wrath, so I just, and nor did I see Interstellar. So I had no touchstone for it. I wasn't taught it, and I didn't consume the two big things that seems to have like incidentally taught a lot of Canadians about it. I did see Interstellar, so maybe I have no excuse. But I, I didn't read mm, Grapes of Wrath, and I'm enough. not from the prairies. So thank you for letting us know. This is one of the only shout-outs we give in this kind of way. This, the response was overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was wild. The people who, And, yeah, just a lot of sincere curiosity. Be like, do you not know about the Dust Bowl? And I'm like, I don't know. Do you Americans not know about the Cod Moratorium? Like, we're from Eastern Canada. We have, we have different uh, forest and ministries and fishery uh, important moments in history, you know? It's fun. What's, uh, what's common knowledge in different places? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've learned a lot. Yeah. And you guys should all look up the Cod Moratorium. Look up the Cod Moratorium. Fun times. That's actually an interesting it, it ride. It is actually really interesting. <laughs> what cod, are, cod are fucked, y'all. We've ruined this planet. <laughs> uh, I think maybe we knew that. Yeah, yeah, we kind of knew that. The Dust Bowl was like, we plant... Americans planted bad and also drought, but uh, the Cod Moratorium is just like, humans are monsters. We've ruined this planet. So let's do a zombie movie. Let's do a zombie movie. Uh, let's uh, let's in the spirit of ruining in the, the planet. spirit of ruining the planet. Let us continue to do it with zombies. Uh, let's get into today's episode. Let's talk about the 2004 Dawn of the Dead. So we've seen 2004's Dawn of the Dead. Was this the first time you saw it, by Indeed. the way? Indeed. I'd only seen the original. Ah, okay. So your first time seeing it. A rewatch for me. Diana, did you like it? Oh, I liked it fine. Yeah, it was... It was completely non-intrusive on my life. It was like, it wasn't the best zombie movie I've ever seen because I've seen the original Dawn of the Dead. Um, but it was definitely not the worst zombie movie I've seen. Yeah, the, the characters are all like middling. Like every performance is fine. No one is bad. Hardly anyone's really shining. The zombie stuff is like fun sometimes and kind of just just there sometimes, not boring, but you're like, yeah, that's a zombie. I've seen him. 
Um, but some stuff's cool. So yeah, it's it's like it works fine for a zombie movie. I don't have any like plot holes or like that character acted dumb c- problems, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is a huge thing that I usually have for these kind of. We movies. have maybe one character Ooh, acting dumb, but yes, yes. yeah, there will be but a few, but, but, but not act- as many as you would think. Even though she acted dumb, in my soul, I get it though. Yeah, I understand. We'll talk about that. Yeah, but yeah, so I'm I'm gonna give it just yeah, just like a, a pretty high like, definitely not a love, but surprising like. Andrew, what about you? I surprisingly liked it. I, I I quite liked it. It's not a love, but I quite liked it, which is very surprising for me because this is a movie that when I first saw it, I very, very much disliked it. You I, told me that, so I was kind of going in worried. I hated it at the time that I saw this. This is something I've really softened on and come around on. Uh, I think at the first time that I saw it, I'm I'm a big Romero fan. I love... Uh, I love the original uh, of the Dead series of films. I love Romero. It is such a huge, pa- like a huge, huge love for me. So this was a very shocking remake to see at the time, uh, and it felt very trendy because I think Twenty Eight Days Later had just come out, and I mean like within the year come out. And then right away, it was just, it felt like a very made-by-committee movie studio thing to be like, Fast Zombies, that's the new thing. Get them in. Get them in the new movie. Romero's out. Fast Zombies are in. And I actually really liked 28 Days Later, and I got nothing against Fast Zombies, but it felt like a bastardization of a movie that I love and have so much fondness for. And it doesn't have anything to say. And the original Dawn of the Dead has... It has things to say. It has it has themes and it has observations. And this doesn't have any of that. And that's okay now on rewatch. So first viewing, it was a shocking bastardization of a thing that I absolutely love. Now with enough time having passed, I'm just like, oh, this is just a totally fine thing that is a high like for me. I liked it a lot with no expectations and actively trying not to compare it to Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, I think that would be the big difference, which I can definitely see. I think if it's just like, it's a good zombie movie, and it's not a good remake of Dawn of the Dead, because Dawn of the Dead is about, you know, slow zombies and really character building, and it's got themes, and so many of the Romero zombie ones do, and 28 Days Later does, too. Yeah. Like, it's got fast zombies, but it's got themes. This lacks any themes. And any. And frankly... But it's a fun zombie movie. Absolutely. And frankly, doesn't even use the mall as a set in an, any kind of important or relevant way to the point where if this movie simply changed it from a mall to literally any other building, it has no effect on the movie. And then if it wasn't called Dawn of the Dead, you would just call it like hide from the zombies or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Great but, title. A no. Great title. Uh, but if you just legally don't use that name and set it anywhere other than a mall... It is so not even close to the original in any way. It's legally different, and you wouldn't have to pay any licensing. So it is one of those dumb, like, why did you even pay the Mm. rights and the licensing to get that thing when you don't need or use any of the things from it? So that's why I didn't like it at first. But now I just try to imagine it's not a remake, and I'm fine with it. That totally makes sense. Yeah, I imagine the licensing pays for itself in the box office, especially if you're only doing one movie. Yeah, I could see that. People are going to come to a remake of Dawn of the Dead when, the, in a way they might not come to hide from zombies. Fair. Your, your my, movie. My terrific name. Your, your wonderful film. I'm, so, I'm not as good as naming films as the director of Legends of the Guardians, The Owls of Ga'ul. <laughs> I'm not as good at naming films. As Batman v Superman, Dawn the, the of colon, Justice. Dawn of Justice, or Such as he wanted to call title. it, Son of Sun, Night of Night. <gasps> Uh, so I'm not oh. as good at naming movies as oh. visionary director Zack Snyder. Son of Son, Dot, Night of Night. Atrocious. Absolutely awful. Mm-hmm. Someone's got a Snyder cut these names down. <laughs> uh, Oof. But I, but I liked it. I liked it. I also, yeah, I also liked it. I think if we're going to talk about like... Like positives mm-hmm. for performances. Uh, Ving Rames obviously owns it. Owns it, and then out of nowhere, Michael Kelly, who plays CJ, the mean security guard, yes, yeah, really builds a performance. I think the only guy who's like building something in this movie. 
build something that the script doesn't earn, but he earns it as an actor. And I think that that's really important. That It's a weird, like, compliment complaint mixed in. I'm like, he's really good, and the script didn't get him here. Yeah, and and they so his character is the security guard at the mall who points a gun at all these people when they show up, and he's like, fuck you, I'm in charge. We're not helping anyone. We don't let anyone in. We're locking you in a room. You can shit on the floor. I literally hate you for being here. I think he has a line that's like, I will kill you all before I will let a chance of me dying. Yeah. Like, I, before I let anyone in here who might be infected, I will murder every single one of you. Absolutely. Straight Ab- up an actual line he has. Absolutely. Just a, a, a real piece of shit. Uh, and they come in hot and hard with him. And I think the only, like, soft moment they have is him just in a jail cell, like, reading a mag, reading, like, a girl's, like, a teen Vogue or something uh, about, like, how to date. And he's yeah. like, oh, I guess you need trust. And then he turns it all around. The writing's not there. But he, as a performer, I buy this character coming around to be like, oh, fuck, we've got to do all this together. Yeah, I bought it as a performance. It really did need, like, one scene. And they almost had it because he goes down to, they kind of are just released from their cell and they're not, they don't show the scene. Yeah. There's no scene where, like, they're, like, decide to let them out of their cell finally. And I think that would be the trust scene probably. Like, we're going to let you out. We're going to give you a gun. Maybe they save his life right. from a zombie. And that builds the trust. And then he changes. But, yeah, th- he really needed a turning point other than I read a Cosmo quiz. Yeah. It wasn't It wasn't enough. But, he, the, but I still liked seeing the turn of, like, he eventually does the sacrifice play with the propane tank so that yeah. they can all live. And it's... And it felt earned, even though it wasn't, but earned solely through performance. Yeah, I, full, I fully get that. Yeah, great are, performance from him. What do we know this guy from? He's so familiar. Uh, I, I actually don't I know. I like he's, he's in everything. He's probably like one of like the fifth lead in many things. Right. Uh, and I, and I'm, I'm sure he is. A lot, of, a lot of actors in this are regularly working actors. Like uh, uh, Ty Burrell, who went on to be the dad from Modern Family. Very strange seeing him play the... Rich, douchey, douchey, complete asshole. Such a opposite of the the uh, ten season long character that he's now known for. But he does a really good job of that uh, as as a character actor. Like it's it's remarkable what range he has for someone that has been playing one note for so long. He does because when I think of him, because I don't watch Modern Family, I actually think of him as Betty's boyfriend in The Incredible Hulk, starring Edward Norton. Oh, um, and he's just kind of like a walkover kind of like. Right, he. Slow. I almost forgot that. Yeah, yes. he just kind of walk all over him. He's not really much of anything. So to yeah. see him as like a jerk who like stands up for himself in a selfish way. Sure. Not stands up for himself and like, I deserve this way, but like, I'm just gonna like, I'm not gonna die and I'm gonna sacrifice you. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it, he's got he's got some range and I even, yeah, I believe that he was like a rich dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a believable, he's believable as that character. I really like Ving Rhames as well as- Ving Rhames can always crush it. Always. Always crushing it. You know who you're getting when you hire Ving Rhames. Uh, I'm not seeing wild range from Ving most of the time but owns this role and does a really good job of immediately having the attitude of a guy who knows that cops don't exist anymore. Like, there is no, there is no like, Rick Grimes of his character to be like, I need to continue symbolizing what the world once was. Look at my badge. Yeah. yeah, I'm Rick Grimes, the sheriff. I'm going to wear my badge and hat for five years into this to remind people of what law, like, within one hour of the world going to shit, Ving Rhames has immediately just been like, cops don't exist anymore. I'm done. I am just getting to my brother and I don't care about anything else. The zombie apocalypse has been happening for about an hour and he seems over it. Yes. He's already like, let's do it, I guess. But like, not, but not like I want to die way. Just in like another day in the zombie apocalypse, even though it's day one, but I absolutely believe it. And like, what a, what a great, uh, what a great little gift to Sarah Polly. You wake up in the zombie apocalypse and Ving Rhames is like, I'll protect you. I'd be like, Oh, thank God. Yeah. Oh, thank God Ving Rhames is here to protect me. Oh, I would I would be happy to see actor Ving Rhames. <laughs> I, I think he'd do a great job. I think he would do pretty damn good. And also his character, either one. Yeah, and also his character, and like, they never get into it, but he's got like a United States Marine Corps tattoo on his arm, implying that he was in the Marines before he's now a cop. So he's just like, the badass. And doesn't even like, tell Sarah Polly's character, Anna, to follow him or, like, I'm going to protect you. He finds this woman 
And she's just like, please don't shoot. And he's like, okay, and walks away. And like a stray dog, people just start following, like stray dogs, people just start following him. And he has not told them to. He is not trying to protect them. He's not like, I'm a cop, I'm going to get you to safety. Or like, I've radioed in and the captain said, no, he's just like, I'm walking. And if you choose to walk behind me, that is your prerogative. Yeah, he has no illusions that his radio is going to work or that anything's going to happen. It reminded me more of the way people follow him reminded me of when you see children at a daycare out for a walk and they hold that little rope behind the teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really reminded me of that, the way they're all just like, well, guess stand right behind him. He's, he's big and he's got a, she's in charge. He's got a shotgun. And he's so calm. <laughs> he's so calm. <laughs> Everyone hold your little rope. The... <laughs> You got to hold the little rope. It is very it. much like that. And he commands things in a way he he uses hand signals. Like the like our army and marine like hand signals. Like he puts the fist in the air, he puts the fist in the air to like stay crouch. He puts the hand up and be like move, head over there. He's giving hand signals to Mackay Pfeiffer and the other people as they all grab the kid rope and line up behind him. And these other people weren't in the army. They have no idea what these hand signals mean, but there's something about his character that actually sells the shit out of it, where even if you don't know what those hand signals mean, you just see the way his body holds up a fist, and you're like, I fucking know what that means in my bones. Like There is something about him where he exudes the meaning of these silent body gestures and silent moments his character does. He's always teaching. He is a leader, he's a teacher, and I would, I would hold that little rope behind him straight into the zombie apocalypse. Grab the rope, line up. Uh, I will say they don't, I would like a little bit more of a scene about him choosing not to go after his brother. Because it feels like that just kind yeah. of abruptly ended. I, I agree. And I think he could have crushed like, like a having to choose to stay behind kind of choice scene. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, this movie has a big problem with that a few different times of either cutting away too soon or showing up too late, which yes. typically is a actually good dramatic tool. You want to arrive late, leave early. You don't want to overstay your welcome, but it's way too late and way too early where we're skipping all of the important stuff, whether it's like, he's like, I got to go save my brother. And the other guy's like, let's talk about it. Then we cut away and now he's cool. Like he's not on a, like a, he's not uh, uh, seeing only red. He's not in this rage mode of I've got to go find him. I'll kill all the zombies. He's cool now. And we just don't get to know why letting the guard, the security guards of the mall out of the jail cell after they've turned the guns, like you said earlier, we don't see that. So there is a lot of this like, okay, and now it's for the big moment where these character tensions come to a head and... That was resolved off screen. Oops, yeah. Oh. Like, so much is off screen in a weird way. Even like, and this was obviously a choice, but even everything with Andy in the gun shop just being over the radio. Yeah. And that's cool for a little while, like hearing things happen without seeing them. But then once Nicole gets in there with the dog, it's kind of just too much that you're not seeing. Yeah. Um, they don't show you shooting a baby either, but I'm kind of cool with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely cool with that. <laughs> I'm cool with not seeing a baby get shot. Definitely cool with not seeing that baby get shot. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was an interesting sequence that didn't feel like it felt fit this movie. I I think it fit this movie, but not the Mackay Pfeiffer has like been secret has his wife secretly chained in a room that no one has gone into and you aren't allowed to see. Like, that feels like if this movie took place in the suburbs, mm. like in a gated community, and this was a block of houses, ooh, ooh, and he's the guy whose uh, wife doesn't come out. This isn't the one in a mall. Uh, if this was in a, yeah, a suburb gated community, and you have a bit of privacy. But it's weird that Mackay Pfeiffer is such a big character at first. It's obviously like Sarah Pauly is the lead, then Ving Rhames, then we meet Mackay Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. And Mackay Fiverr's uh, introduced as this character who Ving Rhames immediately is like, you steal TVs, which I'm like, wh why would you, what? Did you arrest him once? Is there a line cut about this? Or are you racist even though you're also black? This is weird. There's a weird thing between them. Then they have this scene later like in a washroom where Mackay Fiverr's like, you believe in God, huh? I can tell. And then they have like a religious conversation. So it's meant to be like different walks of life and like different 
beliefs and how are they going to clash? And Mackay Pfeiffer then, like, 30 minutes in, just stops existing in this movie because he's hiding in a room with his wife doing this weird, like, C-plot just for the sake of, like, having a a, pro- a creepy zombie baby. It's mm. just got a prop gag. It's basically just a prop gag. Which kind of even could work, but you've set up all this stuff with Ving Rhames, and Ving Rhames, I think, never enters the baby scene. No. I think he was down in the basement during it, trying yeah. to fix the generator. So you've set up that he has this like contentious relationship with Ving Rhames, and then Ving Rhames isn't the one to kill you or shoot your baby or shoot your wife or have to talk you down and tell you to kill your wife, maybe. like yeah. It seems like that's where the relationship should go. Instead, the random trucker lady... Yeah. Was part of the scene. Who's a cool character, and and she does, she owns this character really well. I was really upset she died so soon. I thought she should be in the movie a lot longer. Like, anyone who's so cool that they just save six random people, she's like, I was just driving by and I had to save them. So (laughs) I was at the church and I said, Get in. And then I survived the zombie apocalypse for like two days just driving around. (laughs) Like, she's so cool. She had rolled into one character. Uh, She had very Michael Gross and Reba McIntyre from Tremors. Oh, shit. Energy of that, like, I am the chaotic outside character that is just kind of running through this movie like a freight train. Mm. And I really loved it. I ate up every moment that uh, that she was on screen. But without the apocalyptic preparedness, just being a genuine everyday badass. Mm-hmm. Like, she wasn't like, I was ready for zombies and I went out and I had guns and I had food. She was like, no, I was just driving my truck. No, she's just and like, I, no, had, this... I had some room in the back. Mm-hmm. So I put people in there. One of them's in a wheelbarrow. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Ladies, it's in a wheelbarrow. Yeah, she shouldn't have died so soon. She was too good. Mm-hmm. She was too good. Died too soon. Uh, I really like also the, the the two other leads. I like Sarah Pauly in this character. She gives me strong Brie Larson vibes this whole movie, actually. Uh, I like her. I like how they set up her character. Just immediately in the hospital, there's really strong setup writing off the top of this movie, and it frankly feels very James Gunn. Mm-hmm. Before we get to the mall... That's where I can actually like feel and see the James Gunn writing in this because this is one of the f- the th- this is one of the few movies that James Gunn wrote and didn't direct. This was before James Gunn had power as a director, so it's a James Gunn script and a, a Zack Snyder film. And I feel like there's these little like character beats and moments that don't make sense but feel human that feel very James Gunn, like her coming home from uh, from working at the hospital. And she just walks into the bedroom with her husband who's watching a show. And her husband's just like, they voted off the the mailman guy. She's like, oh, no, I liked him. And we don't know the show, but we, like, we all know what a reality show is. We know shows that vote people off. Like, it's such a couple thing to be, like, our nightly show or, like, the show we watch in bed where someone gets voted off is our thing. And it just solidified their relationship so strongly in seconds and that felt very much James Gunn peppy writing and something that you would not get in any Zack Snyder film today. And, and we'll was, see next week, but doesn't feel <laughs> we'll like see a... see when Legends of the Guardians, the Owls <laughs> of Google. Exactly what I'm referring to. Um, yeah, it definitely was. And even in little ways, they set it up. Like in the hospital, she was like leaving her shift an hour late. So when she got home, she'd missed her show. But that's yeah. not a plot point. That's just a thing to bring up with her husband so she can be like, you missed it. He got kicked off. And like instantly, but he's not mad about it. Yeah, yeah. He's just like, oh, no, you missed it. It's, you can't record it. It's 2004. And we watch everything live still. <laughs> so a yeah. little, little you flashback. You could, but we didn't. And we did. Not you, not like an American Idol like Destination show. TV, you you didn't no, record. No, yeah. you can't Anything with someone that. voted off, you didn't record. No, everyone already knows. Yeah. It's too late. Um, yeah, so lovely little relationship building, even when she just takes off his shoes. Um, I do love a tight explanation of why people miss an apocalypse. It was very like Independence Day, like we were having sex in the shower and we missed the breaking news about the zombie apocalypse. And, right. Like, Independence Day, they like slept in and all their phones were unplugged and they missed the alien invasion. Uh, I do, I do like a good little like this is why we don't know about it mm-hmm. setup. Um, I think there's a lot of things that feel very James Gunny. I know he wrote it, so they should. But, like, a lot of moments where I'm like, oh, I wish James Gunn directed this because this moment's fine, but James Gunn directing it would be amazing. I think my biggest one is the elevator's doors closing over and over again during that standoff. Yes. Which works fine in this movie. Yeah. But James Gunn would have made that the greatest scene 
in te- in movie history, like a standoff with two groups of humans who both want to survive and live in this floor, and it's so tense, and the elevator doors keep closing, and Mackay Pfeiffer has to be like, Duh, and like hit them real quick so they won't close. Yeah, and it's directed as, and shot as an annoyance. Like it's funny to us. It was kind of funny. We it's laughed funny. a little. But it is shot and see, and sh- and portrayed to be like, look how annoying this is in this tense moment. Whereas you're right, if James Gunn directed it, it would be like, can you believe how awkwardly funny it is that they de- need to do this? It would be done as a comedy. And Snyder doesn't really know how to do comedy in, in any regard. I feel like now, as we've mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, we're becoming Snyder experts. And I just can't recall anything where I'm like, oh, he gets comedy. And not even that he doesn't want to do comedy. Because I I get that. You know, like, Nolan has no interest in doing comedy. Or, like, there are directors where I'm like, you have no fucking interest. But sometimes a sliver of light shines through where I'm like, oh, you could. But you have no interest in doing it. But Snyder, there's no there's no shining light coming through where I'm like, you could do comedy. No, he can do cool things that will yeah. make you go, whoa, that's really cool. But nothing that will be like, that was the best joke I've ever seen. Mm. Uh, so yeah, that's 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 a, like there's little moments like that throughout the entire movie where I'm like, ooh, the James Gunn version of this would have slapped. On paper, in the script, that elevator door thing is absolutely fucking hilarious. You're yeah. you're you're dead on right. Yeah, that would have been one of Gunn, the funniest possible. As he things. wrote that to himself, was probably like, this is the greatest scene in a zombie movie of all time, and mm-hmm. I can see it perfectly. I think another very gun moment, which actually works quite well still, is. Uh, when Sarah Polly comes out and she's like, Frank, Mike's co- Michael's coming to shoot you when they decide to kill the first guy who got bit right. that they know about who will turn. Super funny. Yeah, just walking right in. Michael's coming to shoot you like like they're having a fight over dinner or something <laughs> like, like, yeah. with no gravitas. I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it felt very, you could feel the James Gunn within that. Yeah, that could have been done as more comedy. And instead it was done to be like, look how tense this moment is. It's the race to go tell him. And she tells him and he's like, yeah, you probably should shoot me. Which I respect to that dude as well. Uh, but that could have been comedy in the, there are so many like undercutting to be like, we're going to shoot him. I'm going to tell him that you're going to shoot him before you shoot him. And then him being like, no, it's okay to shoot me. Like that is just constant rug pull comedy. That's so funny. It's so good. It could have been, should have been so funny. It's funny, but I do also really like that there are many characters in this who are willing to die once they get the bite. It is, it is like, it mm-hmm. gives you like a nice little hope in humanity. Like that guy's like, let me say goodbye to my daughter. Let me die natural causes and shoot me in the head. Yeah. Um, as obviously, the ending. What's that guy's name? Michael? Peter? Uh, uh, the the, the Michael. Char- yeah. Michael. The Michael. character, yeah. Yeah, Michael. The second he gets bit. The second he gets bit. He's like, I'm going to help you as far as I can. Oh, I'm bit. I can't go to the island. And to a certain degree, even Mackay Pfeiffer and his wife gets, like, the bite. Ooh. And even though he does hide it, he's like, we're hiding it. And I am chaining you down to make sure, like, it is, there's still layers of precaution there. Yeah, he's, like, on the off chance somehow that this baby's not infected. Uh Uh-huh. I gotta, I gotta tie you down, but you're not living. I don't think you're a human being. No! It's not like in some movies and zombie stuff we've watched where they, like, try to talk to them and keep them. Although he did say you can't shoot my family at the end, which I was, I was like, I don't feel like you're this far gone. Uh... And and that is one problem that the movie has is that like they didn't really show his insanity because he just stopped existing about 30 minutes into the movie. He just left camera and never came back. So it's yet another example of like the turning point for a character, whether it's the security guard CJ wanting to be a friend and redeem himself uh, or all of these other little turning points. They happen off camera and then we see the end, but we don't see the most important part for these characters. Yeah, the the turn is where the emotion lays. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know, the surprise is later when they've actually done the turn, but mm-hmm. seeing the turn is where you're like, oh my God, the turn. The turn. But they all <laughs> act rationally for the most part. It is nice. Which is nice. Uh, well, let's take a little break in the podcast to thank our sponsor of today's episode. I want to give a shout out and thank you to our friends over at Care Of. Yes, Care Of is going to send you a monthly your monthly vitamins mm-hmm. and they are going to be So great. Oh, it's going to be so helpful because when you go with Care Of, uh, you're getting your recommendations of uh, of daily vitamins, and they're individually wrapped packets that are perfect for getting back into or starting a routine because you've got everything 
ready for your morning or your day, whenever, when any, any time of day when you want to take it, but it's wrapped. It's all the vitamins you need. You don't need special like pill cases labeled with the day of the week. You're not opening four, four different bottles of whatever you're taking. And these Easy. little packets, your names on each individual one. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel so cool every morning when you open up your vitamins. You're like, well, these are Diana's vitamins. My name's on the packet. Right there. It's I'm not going to take yours because guess what it says on there? Mine says Diana. Yours says Diana. And you know what yours says? Mine says Andrew. And they're cool. Yeah. Although I guess I could have given them a fake name. I, it could have just said Cool McGee. Uh, I got to go into my Care of Online account and change my name to Cool McGee. Mine's going to say Batman. Oh, that's fun. Uh, <laughs> but you can change your name to whatever you want it to be. But the important thing is, is that when you fill out their online quiz, they're going to ask you questions about your diet your lifestyle, any health concerns or specific things that you want to address. I'm, I'm a vegetarian, so I'm able to input that information. And they're able to formulate things like, uh, like, like the vitamins that I'll need that I might be deficient of because of a vegetarian diet. But their online quiz, it's quick, it's smooth, it's easy, and it just helps that you're going to get a personalized, tailored approach to your unique needs because you're unique. You need something different than what I need. Yeah. And you can retake the quiz at any time as your goals and needs change. I might get rid of my vitamin D soon because it's getting real sunny out and I'm outside all the time, but then I'll prop that back in around January, December, like I usually need. Change it, change it up if you need to. It makes it simple. I take protein powder, which is something that they offer as well. Uh, but one jar of it gets me through like a little more than a month. So like occasionally I'll just need to skip it for a month, but that's super easy to do. I can just go in I can do it. And I also like the dispenser it comes in. It makes it easy to declutter your cabinet because you can replace like a whole mess of bottles with one like nice little dispenser that's ready to go for me every morning. Yeah. And they have no unnecessary filters or artificial flavors in their products. So you can feel good about what you're putting in your body. I especially can feel good. I can speak for at least at the very least their iron pills are incredible. I've mentioned this before, but I have taken three to four different brands of iron pills in my life because I'm very iron deficient. And I always stop taking them because they make me feel like crap. I get sick to my stomach, get indigestion, and I'm like, I'll just take a nap. It's not worth it. These, I've been taking care of iron pills for two months now. I haven't had a single digestive problem. I feel amazing. My energy levels are up. These are wonderfully clean products. You feel great. I feel great. An iron pill I can take. You love it. Uh, so go check out Care Of right now. And for 50% off your first Care Of order, go to takecareof.com and enter promo code TFS. 50. So that's 50%, a uh, huge amount. You get 50% off your first care of order. Go to takecareof.com and enter code TFS50 to let them know that we sent you. And thank you, Care Of, for your support. Thank you so much, Care Of. And now back to Dawn of the Dead. Here is one of my, my big complaints about the, the feeling of this movie is that I really like the setup. All of them coming together and meeting at the mall, the tension, uh, like Sarah Polly losing her husband, meeting Ving Rhames, meeting the other characters, the tension with the security guards, uh, you know, the overtaking the security guards, getting the guns, whole setup, love it, love it. I, I also like the race to the boat at the end. I like that. All the stuff in the mall really doesn't land for me, and that's a big disappointment because I love the original. And I feel like why it doesn't land is that I can't tell the passage of time, and that's definitely a directorial problem. That's not a script thing. That is something that, like, Zack Snyder just didn't have the skills yet to convey that and didn't know how to convey. I honestly don't know if they were there for one week or two years. It, I, there's no indication, really. The only thing that will definitely, it was definitely a short amount of time and I wish it was a longer amount of time because that girl's already bit when they get there, the pregnant girl. Mm. And so <clears throat> I can't believe it's been two years since someone checked on her. She hasn't been chained to a bed for two years. She's supposed to have this baby in like two weeks. Right. So the nurse lady would have like forced her way in there <clears throat> recently or like within the last little while. So this has been, it's only been like, two to three weeks max, I would say. Because also, uh, 
You're not, you need to Aaron. Andy. Andy across the street doesn't seem to have a lot of food. He right. doesn't have two years of food. No, no. So he's just at his gun shop. Um, so yeah, I think it's only been like one week, two weeks, but I do wish it was longer. Cause like, as, cause as you like the original, like they're there for like a year, two years, like a super long time. A long enough time where like they, they have a pregnant character in this. Mm -hmm. And again, it feels like a very superficial remake to be like, okay, well in the original, there was a pregnant character and we have a pregnant character. It's like, yeah, but in the original, she wasn't pregnant when she arrived. Like, that was something that showed the passage of time, that they had been there so long, they had tried to establish a life there. And it eventually reaches the theme of this is actually no way to live and taking a risk, even if, oh, if it's a wild or irresponsible one, might be the only way to truly live. But they have enough time in that mall in the original that it's like, they take things out of stores and like build apartments. They they go to the furniture store and they like create their own sets. They build walls and create like traps in case the mall is ever broken into. Once the mall in the original reaches the state that it's in in this remake, they have scenes of like clearing the parking lot and blocking the exits and like other concerns. It feels like a life has been lived in the original mall. And in this one, it is really just like they show up, they lock up a security guard, uh, Ty Burrell's character fucks a lady, and then they're like, let's risk our lives, this isn't worth it anymore. So by the time that they come to this like conclusion to be like, we've gotta go, we've gotta go find an island, this is untenable, it feels very tenable. It feels like this is, they're still in the honeymoon, smooth sta sailing phase of, almost infinite, like incomprehensibly infinite supplies in the safest location imaginable. Yeah, it definitely doesn't feel like they should be bailing out of there anytime soon. Like every problem has been kind of stoppable. It's not like they're like, there's no way we can stop us all from dying over and over again. Like there hasn't been a breach yet that they haven't caused themselves. Um, everyone who was bit came in bit. They didn't bit bite anyone else. They've, they've barely even gone through the mall. Like, they've only been there, like, a week. I'm like, you're still hitting golf balls off the top, and you're shooting baskets, and you're you're knitting and stuff. Like, you haven't explored everything you can do. You haven't gotten bored of the mall yet. Yeah. Like, this is the most, like, this is, like, teenagers who are, got sick of the mall after one hour. Like, let's go find something else to do. The mall sucks. Like, they want to leave way too fast. They're not out of food. No. No. The power went off for, like, ten minutes. Minutes, and they were like, we got to go. Mm -hmm. It's not safe here. I'm like, it's still, it's still really damn safe. The, the safest, they've almost had no obstacles. And that's the other problem is that the second, the, the middle section of this movie, the second act of this movie is really slow and with no obstacles. And I would say that the Andy, the gun store owner across the parking lot who's running low on food and develops a relationship with Ving Rhames, is really emotional, it made me cry, that's powerful, but it's not tense, there's no action or inciting incident. The whole middle section of the movie is Mackay Pfeiffer has a zombie baby off screen, which is just kind of prop comedy, like a dumb gag, and it doesn't really have any plot relevance or move anything forward or do anything, and they have to go to the basement once. And it's like, if they just stayed in the mall, we could have like a whole like exploring the basement. You know, like there's just not, there's not enough meat in the middle of this movie. There's not. Like too many people also maybe show up because then you can't develop the relationships you've already gotten. Mm. Like Mackay Pfeiffer disappears because six people show up in a truck and now we have to meet all them. Yeah. So he kind of like takes the loss on that one for his character development, what his character's going through. Cause as, cause like the original is four people, I think the original movie. Uh, three. Three? Or three? Yeah, it's three. Three? Okay. Yeah. So three people in the original. And this, I think, is like ten people. So, yeah, there's kind of too many people, not enough relationships, not enough time in the mall. You don't feel tense about it. You don't feel like the walls are closing in and they're going to die or that they're wasting their lives. Like, like a fucking military cop helicopter could still show up. A copter saw you mm -hmm. a week ago. Yeah, absolutely. They could super be like, oh, when we get a chance, we got to go back to that mall and get those people. Like, they could still be on their way. And... And these are things that I, I want to make clear I thought when I first saw the movie. Mm. Because obviously now, in the real world we've lived in, the, the sheer thought of having to spend 
maybe three weeks in a mall to yourself and being like, this isn't worth living. Let's drive off a cliff is we've all proven not enough time to go that insane. Many of us have spent a year barely leaving our house and all of these characters after like two or three weeks are like, let's make a suicide pact. The mall is not enough space for us to live in. If I could have spent this pandemic in a mall, oh my God, like there's beds in there, the TVs are still working, I think the AC is on, the music plays if you wanna have a dance party, like this is a full house. You can socialize with 20 other people while still having enough space that you can never see them if you choose. Yeah, you can Which just, Mackay Pfeiffer does. He's like, we own the, the kids stuff store. Kids store is ours. And everyone's like, fine, we didn't want the kids store. And that's it. He just lives on his own and is just like a hermit and that's fine. This is the, this is so luxurious. So luxurious. And I will say, um, a thing that bothered me about this as well was I thought the mall was gonna be better protected because when they first come upon the mall, there's a huge fence around it. Mm. And it seems like the mall is kind of hard to get into. Right. Like maybe it's one of those malls that only has like one drive through entrance to so you can park and the rest of it's like by the highway so they fenced it off or whatever. Right, um, right. But then like the parking lot is so full. Jammed. So it's like, yeah. oh, you are trapped in there, but that never feels like a tense point. Like it is weird that they're never like, oh, the glass is getting weak or whatever. Like there is... It would. There's thousands of zombies pounding on it every day, every moment of every day. In the original, to prevent that, they have to go out, steal a bunch of 18 wheelers and park it like one inch in front of all the doors so that no, not enough zombies can get like the sheer weight against it to buckle it in. But I would like to see like kind of if that was driving them into leaving, like the constant pounding on the glass and the sound and the tension of if they could break in any moment. Like, right. I think that could definitely drive me into like, we got to get out of here. But they're all so chill so fast. They're like, let's take our telescope to the roof and look at stars. Definitely we won't die. Like, you, it's been a week. You shouldn't be this chill yet. Yeah, it is, it is long enough that romances start. Yeah, and multiple. Multiple romances begin and blossom uh, attachments are made to new pets, which does happen quickly, but romance is in bloom, pets are had, and a woman hasn't turned. A bit woman hasn't turned. And this romance, this Nicole girl, starts dating this guy, and her dad was shot in the head that day. Yes. I'm not looking to, like, maybe, like, you know, have sex with someone, like, get your grief out, whatever. But, like, that's not how you start a relationship. You're still going to need, like, a week or two. Yeah. To be, like, cuddle on the roof. Everyone's lost everyone. Everyone is very traumatized. That's a great point. Yeah, they're all super traumatized. Even, even the, like, the horniest worst of them, which would be Ty Burrell's character, shouldn't be ready to fuck yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Should not mm -hmm. be ready to fuck yet. That's very true. Unless he like didn't see any of it because he was in the back of that truck for too long. Right. And he's just like, what do you guys even, what was even happening out there? There's no windows. My truck didn't have any windows. So He's, he's just he's, blissfully he's stupid. He's literally sheltered. And that is one thing that this movie does a couple of times where they put a few of the characters not in reality, while everyone else is heavily in reality. Like, within an hour, Ving Rhames is like, there is no police. America doesn't exist anymore. The only thing that matters is my brother. And I'm like, right on, Ving. You got it right, man. You fucking fuck him. You're on. Do your thing. You're the king. Uh, but then some of them just have no, like, Ty Burrell's like, I'm still pretty rich. I own a boat. Wanna bang? Hubba hubba da hubba da hubba titties. I it's definitely like, people. Need Everyone's dead. Like, there's no government. How are you still like this? How are you? I mean, I guess maybe you would still feel like a little bit rich if you got to live in the mall. Like, I'm going to put my Michael Kors coat on and I'm going to get my Prada shoes. Like, because right. you're in a mall and you could still do that. But yeah, like, to still act like you're the rich dick and like be like, I'm going to need these boat keys, even though I think we won't be able to get to a boat. Like, he doesn't think they can get to a boat, but he, he's still like, I can't get rid of my boat keys. He kept his boat keys. He kept his boat keys. He left keys. his house with his boat keys that day. He did leave his house on the final his day. boat keys that day. He yeah. must have been on his way to his boat. He must have been on, but didn't get there. But did, even he though had to stop in at the church real quick. He had quick. to stop in there uh, real, real tight. Mm -hmm. uh, but that brings me to then, uh, 
Oh yes, and on the some of them don't know what's going on. The um, oh, what is the the name of the uh, Nicole is the character's name. Lindy Booth, uh, who's the one who chases after the dog. Oh. And at one point when she is in the closet of Andy's gun shop, Andy is clearly a zombie. He's banging on the door, and at this point it has it's the end of the story. The story. It's been several weeks or a month or one day, however fucking long this movie takes place during. And she's on the walkie-talkie, and they're like, are you all right? Have you barricaded yourself in a closet? She goes, yes. Why? Is anything wrong out there? <laughs> it's like, do you, do you know everything's wrong? What, what the fuck is wrong with you to say that sentence? You just drove a truck through a zombie apocalypse and barely made it into that building. Everything's wrong. All of... All of it. All of it. A hundred percent is wrong. And like, like she's like, Andy, what's what's wrong? Like, you've seen people turn. You know the bites turn into death instantly. The like, movie starts with you saying goodbye to your father who got to bit. let your friend shoot him in the head because you understand how severe a zombie bite is. And you're like, why is Andy mad? Girl, come Girl. on. Did he not like the food we sent over? Now, that being said, I feel like we can make fun of her. And I, I'm torn about making fun of her for going out to save her dog. Because <laughs> I'm mm. like, ooh, the real, like, realistic survivor part of me is, like, dumb. But then I'm also like, I think I'd do it. I think I would go out there to save my dog. I would do it situationally. I wouldn't, and I wouldn't risk anyone else. I would not do it in this scenario because it's proven that the zombies do not care or look at the dog. The dog seems pretty safe. So even if Andy turned, the dog's fine. Like you would have to maybe go over there to let the dog out because it's stuck in that house now. But the dog's fine. It's not a I need to do it in the next 30 seconds or it's over. The dog you have had, enough time to formulate a plan. The dog had a minute. Mm. You could have waited till you got like your super trucks ready. Yes. And just uh, and like open the door real quick. Let the dog out. Especially when to leave in your super trucks, you needed to stop there to get ammo anyway. So you just wait until the regular amount of time and then go yeah. get your dog. Mm -hmm. But. And by your dog, I mean the dog you met two days ago as well. It is. And that's the other thing that, that we need to think about. Yes, we would do this shit for Scar, our dog that we love very much. Scar, we got you. We're we looking at him. Uh, he's asleep. He's dead asleep. So we would do this for Scar. This is not her dog. Oh, this this is, a is new dog. a dog. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying I would take care of it, a dog. I don't necessarily know if I'm ride or die for a dog. Especially when you also have like eight humans. Yes. This isn't like an I am legend and you only have the dog. In that scenario, ride or die for the dog. Mm -hmm. yes. Even after two days, you're like, this is the only thing I right. have. Right, uh, you got to. But if you got eight humans and one of them is your boyfriend, mm -hmm. you don't risk your life for that. For that dog. No. Not she's, that dog. She's insane. Yeah. All right. But I'm glad we wrote consensus. Other than Sarah Polly's character, uh, Anna, other than the lead character, all of these women are brutally written, wasted, just m miserable characters. There is, we were talking about this the other day, that it seems, and we say seems because you never fucking know in this era of entertainment uh, who's a, where, when the other shoe is about to drop and who's about to turn. But it seems as though Zack Snyder has grown as a human being. I would frankly be shocked if he, in Army of the Dead and subsequent films, were to treat women and female characters the same way that he does in Dawn of the Dead or in 300. Sucker Punch. Or in Sucker Punch as well, which is... Brutally, like there is one of these survivors, and this is a movie about 12 survivors in a mall. One of them is a female character who is not named. She does not have a name, and she is just fucked by the named male characters. Yeah, she takes her, she her boobs are shown on camera. Yes. And that's the most you get to know about her is what her boobs look like. Yeah. And, and she, then she's killed with a chainsaw. She never even has a scene with Ty Burrell. No, she never talks to him. Just the sex scene. Just so they have never spoken. She doesn't have a human name. And she just 
takes her tits out and they fuck. Mm-hmm. And that's that's her that's her character arc. That's, that's it. That's, that's her whole character. That's her arc. And then yeah, as we said, uh, Lindy Booth Nicole is just like save the dog. I'm kind of an idiot. Um, the Russian pregnant wife is just naive and following Mackay Pfeiffer around like, the, the helicopters will come, right? That's not Russian. Nope, 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 nope. No? <laughs> that, that wasn't Russian. Uh, yeah, but she, but she's like, you will have to go to the hospital. There you go. You've got it. You yeah, got yeah, it. It's yeah. more back in the throat. It's more, yeah, mm-hmm. but, but when she says that line, it's like, you've, the TVs have turned off. The government has failed. Everything's done. And you're like, but when will we get to hospital? And it's not due to you not understanding the English words on the news broadcast. It is due to all of the women being written and portrayed as the dumbest bimbo idiots imaginable other than our lead character. Yeah, because even Mackay Pfeiffer then gets to be like, women can have babies outside of the hospital. There's a nurse here. We're just going to stay here. Like, very rightfully so. Yes, rightfully so, but also terribly written to be like a classic. You know those... You know how women don't know how, how, how bir- birthing works. Yeah, you know, you know, like the calm man who's like, let me explain birth to you. You know that guy. Yeah. Like, fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. Although, um, lady truck driver. Is all right, lady truck driver lady is good. Truck you got me. Driver there. Is you got good. me. There. She she's gone too soon. R.I.P. Lady truck driver, but she's yeah. she's very good. The unnecessary nudity. So, so on, so on top much of, of in in the in the middle section when the literally only non named character in the mall takes her breasts out to have a sex scene, the movie opens with a nude woman leaving a city bus. Where were she? Wasn't even a zombie, I don't think. Like, where were her clothes? I think she was a zombie. Well, she had no blood on her, but even still, well, why well, would that would she, well, that would cover the the body. Cover the body. Yes. Why would she be totally naked on a city bus? Like, why would the zombies rip your clothes, all of your clothes? Not just yeah. like my shirt tore a little, and now my boobs are out. Like, there's no bra, there's no shirt, there's no underwear. Yeah, like but then every bit is gone. Not bitten or disfigured in any way. No, still looks hot as hell. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So just a, a nude woman walking down the street. So we get a nude woman in the, in the beginning. And then the end of the movie during like the credit sequence, the movie ends, it fades to black. And then it comes back just on random toplessness, again, of an unnamed character we've never met and don't know it. It is just a to show that Ty Burrell, just fucks. to show some, just to show some more, t- show some more tits. And yeah. we know that character fucks. You showed him fuck, but it's just his home video. He's basically Dennis Reynolds from It's Always Sunny, where he keeps VHSs everywhere of his bangs. Oh shit! Yeah, he is. He is early, early Dennis Reynolds. <laughs> yeah. What's so upsetting about the nudity is that it's all uncalled for. But like, it's a zombie movie. You can have nudity, but I think. If I'm going to make a complaint about it, I would say there's not enough nudity. Right. Like, it's very weird to just have, like, one. <laughs> right. Like, if you're going to have nudity, then Sarah Polly and Michael should have, like, a full sex scene where, like, there's full, like, there's some butts and there's boobs. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm in a movie with nudity. But the way that there's just, like, like quick cuts of breasts, like full breasts, just makes you feel like, oh, why, ew, I feel like I'm not in that movie. Like, was that a mistake? Yeah. It doesn't feel like it should be here. This doesn't feel like a breasts movie. I, I, I fully agree with what you're saying. So you I can hear you struggling in? to describe it, but you're right. You're 100% You have to go right. all in or no? Well, you have to go all in and you have to add some sensuality to breasts yes. as well. It's not just looking at pictures on the internet. Because the... Breasts are f- the breasts of this movie are filmed the same way that a zombie murder is, which like the movie seems to acknowledge it's smut. Like it's as the movie has the perspective of a like fourteen year old boy, where it's like, and then they're at the mall and they've got this, and then this character does this, and then it's like zombie bite, blah, 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 titties, and then anyway we go back to the mall, and be like, no, you can't just like scream titties mm. and then run out of the room. But it's these quick cut edits to be like, what if I showed you horrific violence? Quick cut. Ha, that was violent. Anyway, let's calm down. And then titties. It's like, no, don't treat titties the same way you do horrific violence. Yeah. You kind of need to be comfortable with showing titties. Yeah, there is a weird, there, Zack Snyder's sexuality filming is very strange. Because in 300, it's like, 
there is a sex scene. There's a lot of titties, but it's like a full sensualized sex scene with uh, Lena Headey and uh, Gerard Butler. Uh, Gerard Butler yeah. Like they're both naked. There's a full sex scene, and then there's a, a sexual assault later, which sucks. But I don't think her breasts mm-hmm. came out during that part. And then we talked about how in Sucker Punch, they're always like wearing skimpy outfits, but they're never touched and they're never actually showing any skin. So it's his relationship with sex and boobs is is very confusing. Yeah. It's like he feels like they have to be there, but he doesn't actually want them there. It's really strange. It feels very bro-y, like, there was tits in my movie. It's like, oh, shit, you must have had a lot of fun. It's like, no, it was, like, real quick. I didn't do, I didn't, like, want a lot of tits. Like, he, <laughs> like that's not who he is, but he's trying to impress a friend's older brother. Yeah, it's exactly what it feels like. Because, <laughs> like, as he's been growing, like, they've this has really re- been removed from his repertoire completely. Yeah. Um, Like... Yeah, because, like, Wonder Woman, absolutely wonderful portrayals in all of his films that she's been in. Right. Um, Man of Steel, like, I think, was Lois new topless in, like, Batman v Superman, but you never saw anything when she's in the tub? You never see anything. You get, like, a little like a bit cute, of top boob. But it's actually, like, a cute little scene with her and Clark. Yeah, it's it's one where it's actually normal human sexuality. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's yeah, I, I don't understand what he's going for, but I feel like he's past it. yeah. Like, like there, this will not be an army of the dead. I would feel comfortable saying that, yeah. Not just because I don't think Netflix can show boobs. Um, uh, no, Netflix can, can show, show boobs. Oh, yeah, there's, oh, bo- there's boobs yes. on Netflix. Yes, uh, yes they can. They, yeah, 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 they can go all out on Netflix. I do, just because it takes place in Vegas, I think that there is going to be strip club humor mm. uh, to be like, uh, look at how seedy Vegas is. Like, I think that there will be that kind of... I, it will be a big barometer next week when we cover that, when we see it. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, But next week when we see and cover that, that'll be a good barometer to be like, is this still somewhere inside of him? And I think just due to the setting and the advertisements of this movie, I think it will be, but with a different tone of like playfulness and oddly enough, almost like closer to where James Gunn is today. (laughs) No, like, no, I, like he de James Gunned a James Gunn movie with Dawn of the Dead, and his next one might be more James Gunn than when he worked with James Gunn. I totally agree because the trailers make it look like very action packed, very fun. Like, and like if I think if someone is naked, it will be like a completely naked zombie chasing you, and like it will be integrated into the scene. Maybe integration is what I want. Yeah, integrated. Yeah, like part of it, so it feels like it's in the same movie that you're watching. Yeah, yeah. I can, I'm I'm genuinely quite excited, and I think I think as we've said, like he's grown a lot. I mean, obviously the whole thing about taking out Chris Chris Delia and putting in Tignatoria. Tignatora. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Delia or Delia, I, I forget how to pronounce it, but fuck it, fuck him. He's dead to the world. Who cares? He's he's been removed from history. Yes, and, and replaced, replaced with, with Tignatoro. As you should. Yeah. Everyone should be replaced by Tignatoro. So yeah. that's it's Taro, I believe. Taro, sorry. Yeah. I don't have a IMDb for that one. That's okay. fine. But yeah, like good steps. Yes. I'm proud of this man. I, I fully agree. And I can get on board with that with him as a human being. Every time we cover him on this podcast, we may <laughs> not like his work, but he seems to be a lovely human being who we wish well, who grows as a person. And and rightfully so, because I think that uh I was I was uh, talking about this uh, the other day with a few people. I think he even sent a, a few tweets to the same regard to be like, you should evolve and grow as both a human and as an artist. Mm. You know, like you should you should never be the type of son of a bitch who committed crimes in your past. But like when I look back at my stand-up act from 10 years ago, you know, I'm like, I don't like most of these jokes. I'm like, none of it's a crime, but like... It's just a lot of it's kind of gross or dumb or immature. And it's like, oh, yeah, I was gross and dumb and and immature. And you should look back at your earlier work like that. If at any point you start looking back at your earlier work and you're like, man, 20-year-old me really nailed it. I guarantee you 20-year-old you did not in (laughs) any way. So if you are thinking that about your career, that's probably the worst possible sign so I don't know. I think there's there's just something so interesting about Zack Snyder. I'm like, you're evolving, you're growing, you're maturing in front of our eyes in a way that I really enjoy. Yeah, I feel like we're like looking at our little boys all grown up. He's not trying to impress his older friends with unnecessary boobs anymore. He's he's yeah. like really integrating women into storylines better. He's 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 done it all. 
Yeah. I'm I'm proud of this man. Yeah, I mean like yeah, we've been rewatching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and I feel like all of that crew falls into the same regard to be like Mythic Quest is such a an emotional evolution for a Rob McElhenney creation from what It's Always Sunny is. Like it's nice to see this kind of like progress and evolution and growing as a as a human being and it being influenced in the art that you create. It's been lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel like we should wrap up, but I did want to say, I feel like we haven't talked about Andy's emotional journey in this, and I do have to just, that was heartbreaking. Heart, th- this this is, was the heart, heart of the movie, was th- this Andy relationship. This is what elevated it to a high like. Yes. I think without Andy, this movie is just a like, a meh, a fine, uh, but with Andy, I, I actually cried. Like it, It's a story that makes me cry. Him? This quiet friendship between him and Ving Rhames' character. This quiet friendship when he holds up, when Ving Rhames holds up a sign and it says five days and Ving Rhames is so excited because they're going to all escape in five days and Andy just holds up a sign that says hungry. I burst into tears. Just yeah. one word. And like he's shirtless and you can see how skinny he's gotten. And you're just like, he's not going to make it. We got to go now. Like you're with, you're with everybody who's like, we have to go now. He's not going to make it. Yeah, And it's the most human moment of the entire movie, even though the movie acts like other moments are more human than that, yeah. like shooting the dad or things like that. Like this is the crux of humanity in this movie is when they all say we have to go save Andy because he's out of food. Yeah, just just this quiet, yeah, this quiet moment of a character that we've literally never heard or never spoken to before, but we as an audience form a bond with in the same way that the characters do. Mm-hmm. Incredible storytelling. That was the highlight of the movie by far. Oh, hands down. It's... And also when CJ uh, gave the guy guns so he could haul him away, it was an incredible moment. Yeah, that was really <laughs> the good The guy too. who couldn't walk, he's like, hold the guns while I pull you? Brilliant moment. C- CJ's, CJ's coming around sincerely warmed my heart as well. To be like, I feel like that was a subversion of a horror trope or of a zombie trope to be like, uh, you know, uh, when he has that line where it's like it's about trust and he gets it given an ax and never betrays them, like e- ever. No, he's all in. Doesn't do the walking dead, like let's draw this out for two seasons of like, you know, but like just all in and constantly escalates how much he's in. And... I think, like, it's a nice story of, like, someone sincerely cooling off. Like, he did have a... I don't know if he was fully like this before the end of the world. And it seems the implication might be, like, partially he was at least a dick. But clearly, like, did snap and lose his mind within those first few days. And that's very rational and reasonable. Like, of course you would. It was a bad couple of days. Yeah. And then kind of, like, locking him up, he's like... He cools down. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I get it. It felt like he just needed to try to control everything at first. Mm. And when he lost control, it made him better. Because at first yeah. he was like, I have to lock you up. I have to, the TVs have to tell me how to fix this. He's just waiting for instructions. And he's like telling everyone how to live. And the second that he couldn't do it, it just felt like he was like, oh, this is better. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Real proud. I'm real proud of CJ. I'm proud of Andy. And I'm proud of Zack Snyder for all their progress as people. For, for all their, Yeah. You're beautiful, guys. You guys are crushing it. All right. Well, let's go in for the close where we ask the final question of what would you change? So now that we've discussed everything we discussed, what would you change about this movie? But before we ask that final question, we want to remind you, as we do every week, uh, and if you've already done this, you can skip forward. And if you haven't, you hang right there. Sit your butt down. You Don't touch that button. Unless you're not sitting, you can you can stand for this thing. You just, yeah, but listen. Listen. Uh, If you haven't already, please uh, rate, review, and subscribe, follow on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app that you might use. Uh, I know some of you download this directly from the website or you listen to it in a browser or your own uh, own player or whatever you might be using. And that's great. We love that you're here. We love that you're listening. Uh, We still see that number show up every week and that's fantastic. But if you can, open up, just for a moment, open up Apple Podcasts or some app. If you use Spotify sometimes for music, open up Spotify, uh, Podcast Addict for Android. There's a few different options. Find our show, hit subscribe or follow or whatever terminology they use because that helps us move up the charts, move up the rankings, and makes it more likely we'll get discovered by new listeners. So even if you don't use that app forever, hit subscribe. Hit subscribe on there. Then while you're there, leave a rating and review. Five stars, 
one word. You can say noise. You can say more if you want because we do read them and it warms our hearts. So if you do want to say a nice thing to us that will make our day a bit nicer, which they all they all often do, do that and we will, but you don't have to do that. You can just say noise. You can just say noise. One time we got like three just noises in a row and I did actually kind of like that. That's that was like, nice. That made me giggle too. It was like, look, they no, did no, it no, in noise. a row. Noise, 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 noise. Because like noise would be the title and the subject. Right. So it would be kind of six noises in no, a no, row. No, 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 noise, no, 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 noise, no, 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 And I'm like, is this a targeted? I love this. You guys are fun. I like it a lot. Call us a plate of soup. Whatever you want to do. We'll call you a plate We'll call you a plate of soup. Uh, we really appreciate it. Helps us move up the charts. Helps us find new listeners. And uh, we don't have an advertising budget here at the show for finding new audience. So that is a great way that we find new audience. Or you sharing this show. Uh, share it on your, your Twitter, your Facebook, or whatever social media you use to tell your friends about it. Uh, that way you'll have a friend to talk to about this show. And we might have a new listener, and it costs you nothing. So do that. Free way to support the show. Wonderful. Do that. Tell your friends. Be like, these guys don't know what the Dust Bowl is. You yeah. and your friends can talk about Look that. Look at these idiots. And then laugh at us. We don't care. Laugh at us? With us? With us? As long as you're laughing, baby. And if you want uh, more of us, another way you can support the show is over on our Patreon page, uh, which, if you're not familiar with Patreon, is a subscription service. You can subscribe to the online content creators you love and get cool bonuses, like our monthly Patreon exclusive episode of the podcast. Every month, we do one bonus episode. It's just for our patrons. Uh, right now, the one for this month is Le the, the the Legends of the Gar Guardians. What is it? What is it? Le Gar Legends of the Guardians, Legend the Owls of Gahul. Gahul. Legend of the Guardians, the Owls of Gahul. Will Zack Snyder treat women well? Listen to find out. Will he treat owls <laughs> well? We'll see. It's going to be a journey. It's going to be a family animated movie from Zack Snyder. <laughs> in his career. Really, really wild, unexpected stuff. We're very excited. We're very excited. Uh, so you can head over to our Patreon page if you want to get access to that. On Patreon, you can uh, you can chip in however much uh, you want. You can do uh, you can do a buck, five, ten, fifteen, as much as you can afford. You can subscribe monthly. You can subscribe yearly if you want. If you do yearly, you get one month free. So there's different options. And then uh, once your month is up or your year is up or however you sign up, you can also cancel or change your subscription level at any given time. So it's customizable. It's adaptable. If you got 10 bucks in the budget this month and you want that exclusive episode, go hit it up. If that's not in your budget next month, change it down to a dollar or cancel it if you need to. Take care of yourself. We, we understand that uh, everyone's budget is a little bit different. You do you, but if you can kick in even as little as a buck, that really makes a big difference for the show. It makes a huge difference. The more of you who give a dollar, it all adds up. It really, really does. But also, if you give $10 at any point, you get access to all the old episodes. 60-plus so episodes ready to go. Not just that one. You're ready. You're all, ready to go. So much. All of it. All of the old episodes. Let's go in for the close it's now. It's at patreon.com slash from superheroes. Oh, yes, that's right. I didn't say the word. <laughs> P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash from superheroes. Patreon.com slash from superheroes. That's the place. That's the place. Now, let's go in for the close. And let's ask the final question of what would you change? Uh, Diana, what would you change? Um, a lot of the changes we've gone over already. Uh, CJ would have a bonding moment with mm -hmm. everyone that I think would make his character arc kind of be less of a surprise in a good way. Like, I do want to see his moment of change. I want to see them let him out of the cell. I want to see... I would like to see Michael save his life in the basement, and that's kind of also his change moment of, like, oh, you're going to risk your life for me. I see the value in others during the apocalypse. Of, like, it's not just me surviving alone. I see why I need people. I'd like to learn that lesson. And this is a weird one because we've just... Uh, praised him so much for his growth and stuff. I would love if this was kind of like co-directed by James Gunn or maybe just directed mm. by James Gunn because all the moments I talked about that are so James Gunn that aren't because of the director, like everything with that zombie baby would have been gross in a fun way with James Gunn instead yeah. of just being like, oh, I don't want to see this. Like in this version, I just didn't want to see this, but James Gunn would have made it like Slither-esque, I think. Yeah. And yeah, you'd yeah. be like, oh, this is so gross. Oh, I'm going to look at it. I'm going <laughs> to, like, it's going to be fun gross. Um, so I would like to see the fun gross version of this movie. And I think James Gunn would keep the heart as well. So even though I don't think Zack Snyder did a bad job, knowing James Gunn wrote this, it's hard not to want to see his version of it. Yeah. And seeing like his jokes on paper that I'm like, oh, these would be so different with him as the director. 
Yeah, and and as we've seen with Guardian, he knows Guardians. He knows how to do uh, like an ensemble piece and really make a group feel like a fam, a cohesive Ooh, family. Found family. Yes, he's very good at it. Yeah. So mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of strengths here that he's good at as a director that Zach is not. So I can I can fully see and agree with that. Yeah. yeah. So my change is James Gunn gets to direct the movie he wrote. Fair enough. I'm not mad at Zach for directing this one like I am some other Zack Snyder projects. I'm genuinely not mad, but I want to see the James Gunn version. I think it would be better. Mm-hmm. What, Andrew, what's your change? Uh, my big change is the ending. Uh, I I loathe this ending. That's a huge hate for me. The 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 whole third act of this movie is we've got to escape the mall because we can't live like this anymore. And even though that feeling isn't earned, if I'm just conceding, like okay, that's what you want to do. You want to escape this because it's not worth living like this anymore. They get to the boat, they sail off, and then this whole during the credits thing nihilistic, they reach the island, and then zombies eat them up. La, 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 At, like, ugh, what? Like, the movie ends, and then they go, titties, nihilism. La, 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 la. And you, <laughs> they just vomit all over their own movie, and that's a really douchey thing to do. That's bad. That doesn't feel like James, and since there's no dialogue or plot relevance, it honestly feels like pickup shoots that are just Zack, because mm. it's just zombies with no writing, no plot, no dialogue, no character beats. Yeah, like, so it, what are we going to do for the credits? It's like, I'm going to completely change it. Completely <laughs> piss on the movie, because the point of the the riding a helicopter into the sunset, which is the ending of the the original. You know, you're flying away mm-hmm. uh, from everything falling apart. The point of that, and I think the point of sailing into the sunset in this one, is not the happy ending, we did it, we're flying a helicopter to safety or taking a boat to safety and everything's going to be okay. It is the optimism and hope of the human spirit to be... We are willing to die if things can be better. And that is the point of the ending of the original. And that is the, I think, the point of the true ending of this movie, which is that it's worth dying for the potential of a better tomorrow. And we're not guaranteeing it, but we're not nihilistically pissing it away. And then the during credits ending of the, like, titties nihilism, it was all pointless is just really sad and juvenile and uh, meaningless, really meaningless. Yeah, it it really undercuts the entire rest of the movie. Like, we had two sacrifice plays on the way to the boat, like CJ and Michael both gave up their lives so everyone else could get to the boat. So to have them just die on the island, and the island's full of zombies, it's it takes away everything you've been working for and the idea that there is a better life out there. It's just like, no, you should have just died in the mall. You yeah. should have stayed where you were. You shouldn't have tried to grow. You shouldn't have tried to change. There's nothing better out there. And that's that's a boring, shitty outlook. I mean, even in the same year, we've compared this to 28 Days Later. 28 Days Later has that great hopeful ending with a, like, England's an island. We might be the only ones infected. And then there's a plane at the end. Right. And you're like, ah, there was hope. There is more out there. Right. I'm sorry if you haven't seen the end of 28 Days or, Later. <laughs> or at least it's <laughs> it's listeners. it's contained nihilism. To be yes. like, the, the story of these people might be nihilistic, but there is more outside of this world. Mm-hmm. And I think it's something we've talked about uh, on the podcast before with like certain types of endings and certain types of stories. The that is a theme that can be explored in movies, TV shows, literature, but nihilism and everything was pointless is, I think, what uh, uh, next to time travel, the most <laughs> difficult thing to write. Mm. Theme wise, is the most the most difficult thing to write because if you do not stick the landing 100%, there is no room for error. If you are even slightly off on the landing, it makes it feel not like, well, what's the point of life? Have you thought about that? And it makes it feel like, what was the point of experiencing this art? What was the point of watching this movie? What was the point of reading this book? What's the point of anything? Yeah, so like it's such a, a difficult thing to land if you have something to say. And this doesn't and doesn't. So yeah, I, I would like to just cut out the island at the end. They ride off into the sunset, and it's a great ending just to be like, I have no idea what happens next, but the point of the story was hope. Yeah, they got away, they're together, they're alive. Mm -hmm. Love it. No, 100% agree. 
Yeah. 100% that, agree. And, and directed, and James Gunn directs it. Sure. Woohoo. Done. Done. What, like, if James Gunn has passion for zombies, give James Gunn a Day of the Dead remake. Like, let him do a different Romero movie. I would fucking adore to see that. Andrew, he's so busy. He is busy. He's so busy. He's so busy. Suicide Squad's coming out. He's doing two more Guardians. Yeah. He's fucking busy. But he's I'm still not against it. Yeah. But he's busy. If he has a minute. You got a minute? If he has a minute, we give All right. it to If he him. has a minute, we give him a, a zombie movie. Because I think he'd be great at it. I, uh, I agree. Because Slither's pretty good. I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that's going to be it then for this week. That's it for Dawn of the Dead. In the meantime, uh, if you want to get a hold of us, well, next week we are going to be talking about uh, the Army of the Dead, the new uh, Zack Snyder Netflix original. Uh, you can hear us talk about Legend of the Guardians, the Owls of Gahul, over on our Patreon exclusive episode, patreon.com slash from superheroes. We are Zack Snyder experts. Uh, for better or worse, we are experts. His art is mixed. His personality seems to be good and improving. So that's a win. Check us out next week. In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Ivamy, I-V-I-M-E-Y. You can reach me at Words of Diana. And you can reach both of us at From Superheroes. And we'll see you all next week. Bye.